shock trauma, a race with death. This isn't a television drama, it's real. A rescue that could happen any night in the state of Maryland. They still trapped him, Scotty, or what? Yeah, they're still working on trying to get him out. Am I just one? Yeah, yeah just one. Okay. They're not even sure he's serious yet. They're just... Is that all right? It's three in the morning. A teenage boy has flipped his car on a country road in Baltimore County. He's been drinking. Lucky for him, the accident occurred here in Maryland. Well, we don't know yet. Within minutes, trained paramedics are on the scene. They decide it's a case for Baltimore shock trauma unit. And the Maryland State Police helicopter with trained medic is dispatched for transport. There are 1,400 rescues like this every year in Maryland. Lift his back side up there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can't lift his back side up. He's dragging on that metal there. Oh, you got the food on At a cost of three and a half million dollars, the state provides some of the nation's best emergency medical care for serious trauma victims. Is he conscious? Okay, I can't feel anything. Our role probably is uh, to help stabilize the patient as quickly as possible and then transport as quickly as possible. When we arrive at the scene of a serious accident, the vitals are checked of the victim. Scott, he's back there. Right down there. Okay, you just take it easy. He's going with you too. What's your name? The most important and critical time in any trauma is the first hour. Dr. Cowley, the head of the system, always talks about the golden hour. If we can get the patient from the accident scene to the trauma center within an hour, we feel we've got a real good chance of saving the person's life. That's all right. We're worried about you right now, okay? Now, John, do you hurt any place in your body right now? Most of our transports are serious accident victims. They're uh, multi-trauma. We know you're cold, and we're going to cut. I know, and we're going to cover you right now, okay? Let's get this blanket on. The helicopter has been standing by. It's now 4 a.m. Within 45 minutes of the first call, the victim is stabilized, ready for transport to one of seven emergency centers in Baltimore. Each has its own specialty. Hey, you got it? I'm going to get in the chopper. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Like the majority of critically hurt victims, this patient will end up at the Maryland Institute of Emergency Medical Services. Most people just call it shock trauma. His chances for survival are good. 85% of those who get to shock trauma live. That's twice as many survivors as 10 years ago before this system existed. It's been proven over the years that our success rate is good because of the high-speed transportation. Here are the state police helicopter. We're taking, taking you to the hospital in Baltimore. If the victim is conscious, they're told that they're in a helicopter to please remain still, that we're trying to do everything possible to help them. Can you hear me, John? Open your eyes for me. John, open your eyes. Open your eyes, John. We tell them that they're en route to the shock trauma unit uh, to remain still, and we're trying to do the best possible for them. Quite a few of the victims are unconscious, and uh, there's virtually no conversation between us and them. We just try to, uh, to stabilize them as best as we can in the helicopter for the short flight back into the trauma center. Our program is uh, similar to the MASH unit, which uh, goes out into the field to pick up wounded victims or serious accident victims and transport them to a centrally located hospital. It's 4.10 and the patient has arrived at the center within the golden hour, but the drama's far from over. Keep your head down, John. The next team takes over from where I've left off. The doctors are the ones that have the hardest uh, job ahead, and that's the uh, actual life-saving. They're the most important, of course, because they're going to determine if the patient lives or dies. Accidents are the leading killer of people under 40. That's why the federal government wants systems like this blanketing the country. For the nation, this Maryland unit is a showpiece. For the men and women who work here, it's a nightly race with death. This is the admitting room at Shock Trauma. It's set up like any operating room. The patients treated here are last resort cases, and so you've got to be ready for anything. 
There's always one team of doctors standing by at the hospital to treat patients. And as many as four teams can be called in at a time. Like in any emergency room, there are times when you just wait. Okay, so I have about 20 minutes, right? The patient is said to have head injury, facial lacerations, and fractures of both legs. He's got a pulse of 60, got no BP, no respiration. The helicopter should be landing on the scene in the next, say, 10 minutes, and transport to the trauma center should be within the next 15 to 20 minutes. When I go to the heliport, it's always a fright to think, you know, what am I going to find? Am I going to be able to handle what I'm going to find? Because it's a fear of the unknown. You don't know what you're going to find. And as soon as the helicopter sets down and I can get a look at the patient, you know, it eases things and you just start right in. I like to talk to the patient, let them know that, yes, I'm here, and I like to let them know what's going to be happening to them, you know, um, you know where you are, you're in the hospital, you've been in an accident, uh, there's a lot of people here, doctors and nurses, we're going to try to help you uh, treat your injuries and find out what's exactly where you're injured and what's going on. Did your chest hurt at all? No. How about your belly? A little bit. A little bit. Open your eyes, come on. Open your eyes. Open. Open wide. My job uh, acting as team leader is basically to try and assess what the patient's injuries are and to direct the activities, the resuscitation that will be going on. Okay. We're going to put some IV lines in and take a couple of x-rays. Give me some oxygen to breathe, okay? Once take we're some good breath. Oh. Just here to give. feel a little sick. The idea is to treat the patient Please first, to stabilize them, and to make sure that we have a live patient rather than take wait for a diagnostic me. test that may give us a dead patient. Oh, what it hurt me. Okay. 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 It's on there. Oh, sure. Oh, oh. Uh, Please. Move now. Please, Please move. Please move. Please move. Every patient who's admitted to the uh, trauma unit is frightened if they're conscious. They see perhaps six doctors and three or four nurses and anesthesiologists, all the equipment, and people are sort of at the same time putting needles into them, putting IV lines into them, arterial lines. There will be an admission in five minutes. There will be an admission in five minutes. Trauma is a, sort of a disease that doesn't respect uh, your station in life. It may strike anybody from the President of the United States on down to the Skid Row bum. Nickname's Polak, couldn't get a full name out of him. Uh, respirations are about 20. We give an assessment to the physicians, and then we immediately take a position beside where the patient will be. I guess what I believe makes us function so well is that we have a large number of people who can function as a team, meaning each one knows what his role is. Okay, Paul, off, relax. Come on, take it easy. Nice, slow breath, hon. Relax, babe. Come on, slow, deep breath, hon. That's it. Relax, hon. You're in the hospital. Here you go. That's it. Again. Again. Uh, the thing that probably keeps uh, the team so closely allied and working together so well is the fact that the patients are in such bad shape that egos and positions, relative positions, tend to dissolve in the heat of the moment. But get them ready for There's another one coming, so get them ready for that. There'll be an admission in 10 minutes. 
There will be an admission in 10 minutes. It's a race with death. That's the reason why Dr. Callie has established the golden hour, because with most patients, their system can compensate for an hour. And it's up to us to get them under control within that hour. No. Here? No. Here? No. Here. I'm on my side. Okay. Your side? Does this bone come yeah. here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. The only thing he has is pain in the left arm and pain in the left flank and the right knee. Okay, I didn't take this bandage off. Oh. It smells like he's had a little bit to drink. When you get a large number of patients and there are two teams there, so you're talking not about six doctors, but 12. Listen, what did I tell you about your head? Try to hold your head huh? still. What did I tell you? It appears from someone who's looking in from the outside that there's a lot of confusion. It's not confused for people who are participating in it because each one knows what he's going to do. Okay, Brian, you're in the hospital. Very important to talk to patients, even though they can't answer you. Okay, even though he's unconscious, he may not be able to respond to you, but it's just a security of knowing that somebody is with him. I guess it's my own satisfaction, too. There will be an admission in five minutes. There will be an admission in five okay, minutes. Move your legs, just wag your, your toes. Right foot again. Try moving yeah. your toes for me, sir. Just move his right foot. Okay, there are two words to remember when you're communicating with people or dealing with people during stress. One is sympathy and the other is empathy. And it's a very fine line, you know. One is self-involvement to the point that you can't function. Okay, hon, just hold still, sir. You're going to feel a needle stick in your And the other is self-involvement and giving a, a hoot, but you can function for their good. A little lidocaine on a needle. 140 over 90. It's now 2 in the morning. And the team has treated seven patients since midnight. But the night isn't over. It was that eighth patient that I'll never forget. He was in his teens, had crashed his motorcycle in Frederick County, Maryland. He had almost no blood pressure when they found him. These patients need to be intubated, sir. Take him in your arm. Oh, man, he's pale. Okay. We got to get to work on it. Here, hold it. The admitting room was already full, but the team knew this boy needed help in a hurry. When a severely injured patient gets admitted, the team leader uh, is in overall charge of uh, the resuscitation. Okay, keep thinking in front. All right. Everyone has a pre-assigned job. He's practiced it multiple times before on less critically ill patients. Now time is out of the essence. This patient literally uh, has only a few minutes to live. Okay. Okay, hon. Relax your arm. That's good. Okay. Just keep taking deep breath. Because they're going to be ready to go for the blood pressure on them. Okay. The anesthesiologist uh, was watching the monitor very closely. By monitoring the patient's vital signs, it became clear that his blood pressure was deteriorating, uh, his heart rate uh, was slowing, uh, and that he was almost uh, ready to die. <laughs> When you find when a patient is in arrest, you know what you have to do and you're doing it. And all this time you're thinking, this patient is, you know, they're really in trouble. That they're right on the fine line between life and death. Somewhere, where should it be going? Okay, it should be going. Right. No, it's all blown up at the, at the door. It's all blown up. It's infiltrated, in other words. Okay. Yeah, I know. This heart is empty, man. Oh. It's always in the back of your mind. Oh, you know, is this patient going to make it? Are we going to be able to save him? And that's sort of like your goal. Okay, the blood line. Okay, I'm pushing on the saphenous. Okay, okay. 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 Yeah, now it's going. I definitely feel when we have a patient in arrest that you are racing the clock, and that's in fact what we're doing. The more t time we lose, the more time that they're just slipping away from us. The faster we work, the more blood we can get in or, you know, treatment that we can give. The faster we do it, 
the more time we're given to that person. Okay. 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 Ready? Got the chest tube yet? Heart's not responding. But the heart's not responding to it at all. His heart is really empty. It's really empty now. That's the problem. Ready? Ready? No, he's torn that now. He's dead. Every time we lose a patient, it really hurts. Uh, it's very upsetting to think that we did everything we could and we couldn't do enough at the time. And there are some people, 15% of the people, that we just can't save in spite of uh, all the training and expertise that we have here. It bothers you for a while. Yeah, Eventually, it's all a working through process where you do realize that you, you could not have saved this patient and you accept it. At shock trauma, the care extends beyond the patient to the family. Mrs. Rhines, let me just tell you basically a couple of things about Robert now, okay? I want to just tell you some of his injuries. Okay, first of all, from the car accident, he's got a few lacerations, okay? Those are cuts. He's got one up here on his forehead, and he's got some cuts inside of his mouth. Now, he has some blood in his right chest and his right lung. Yeah. Okay, we had to put a tube in there to help drain that blood. Mm. And we did a special test on his stomach to find out if any areas were bleeding at all, any internal organs. Mm. Okay, and we found out that there was some bleeding in there. Yeah. And that's why they had to take him to the operating room and do surgery right. on his stomach. We found on our investigations that he's got a um, fractured ribs on the right with a hemothorax with obvious internal organ injuries. We're going to do a midline incision, uh, upper abdomen, in order to assess the liver and spleen more adequately. Are you ready? The major problem with trauma is that um, unlike long-term illness where the patient has been sick for a long time and the family has been able to slowly adjust to the illness, in the trauma role it's an immediate thing and one minute the patient is well and an active part of society, the next minute he's critically injured. Uh, he's withdrawn from the family, he may be the breadwinner. Okay. Yeah. I think come down just a little bit of the bovine and then we'll be... I think the role the surgeon plays in talking to the family um, is to make them aware of what has happened to their member, um, to give them an idea of the um, kind of injury sustained, and also to give them an idea of how you feel the patient will fare. Pardon? Yes, we'll put a drain in the liver, so let's get some uh, hefty drains ready. Take a double tie. All right. First your big one, and then... Um, then How's the other case? The other case is the head injury. There are two operating rooms for patients admitted to shock trauma. Both are located right next to the admitting area. A team of general surgeons is always on duty, and specialized surgeons for broken bones, damaged vessels, and a whole list of other specialties can be here at a moment's notice. If your patients, when gets are sick, you need to make rapid decisions, you need to work quickly, uh, because the delays may be the cause of the death of the patient. I think we've, we've controlled the bleeding at this stage. The spleen's out, the pedicle's clamped. Um, so we should catch up with the hemoglobin. If you look at it, uh, trauma is one of the, well, it is the major killer in the under 37 group. Uh, this is the, the potential of the country, the, the new life of the country. Uh, and if you're able to save these people, okay. you've really saved something positively. We'll put our drains in and then we'll close from there onwards. He's also going to have some oral surgery done. The operation is over. The surgical team has done everything it can. Uh, yes, yes. Now the doctor must turn again to the hopes, fears of the family. Internal organ injury. Okay. Now, do you think he'll be all right? I think he should be all right. Um, we must just wait and see. Once he's uh, had this operation, he'll be going to what's called the critical care unit that's on the fourth floor. 
Patients who make it to critical care are by no means out of the woods. Glenn? Hi, it's Shirley again. Okay? It's time to wake up a little bit. I want to know what you can do for me. Okay? You were in an accident about a week ago, and you had a hit to your head, and that's why things that's are correct. a little foggy up there. So I'm just going to check your eyes with the light for a minute. Willie, are you finding it hard yeah. to move still? Okay, that's because they gave you medicine during surgery that paralyzes you. But it'll wear off soon. You're going to take your chest x-ray, and then they're going to let you wake up a little more. She's not following any commands, you know, when you ask her to squeeze your hand or anything, but she opens her eyes and flutters her eyes, and she moves her arms and her legs by herself. So she is awake, but <clears throat> probably not as alert as you or I would be. Doctor the patients in the critical care unit are all in a very precarious state or else they would not be there. You, you find the same type of patient in the regular ICUs at the um, community hospitals and stuff. So we have more of them. You, know, you may see one or two in the condition that we have, but we have 12 of them in that same condition. There's at least one nurse for every two patients in the special intensive care unit. In addition, there are four teams of doctors available at all times. Together, they monitor their patients' vital signs on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. What was the, did you get cardiac output on her then? Or they did a cardiac output on her. Uh, Most patients are unconscious or sedated. Most need mechanical respirators to breathe for them. Every two to four hours, nurses go around thumping backs. It clears infectious fluids from congested lungs. Machines keep these patients alive. They are the pulse critical care. There would be a subhuman quantity about it were it not for the nurses. They're the heart of the unit. Working in the unit, there's hardly any interaction with the patient. We talk to them, we try to talk to them and keep them oriented and talk to them about their families and about where they are and why they're there. I talked to you on the phone yesterday, you remember that? I was telling you everything was fine, your mom's fine too. So just ready for you to get a little bit better. Prudy, your mom and dad left a tape for you to listen to. To help rouse the patients in a comatose state, you do things like um, try to bring the family into it, and since they can't visit, you have phone calls. The other thing that we encourage our families to do is to bring in tape recordings. Um, it, they're just talking letters. It's external stimulus other than just laying there in bed and listening to the respirators and the people talking around them. It's something to arouse them. Okay, just one more time. Glenn, it's important that I know that you're awake. So I'm going to ask you to do some things for me. Can you Sometimes, you know, if a patient's been coming okay. for a long time and you've been going through the routine routine trying to get them to hold up the finger or two fingers. Can you hold up one finger on your right hand? Glenn, can you hold up your finger for me? Come on, sweetheart, that's it. And he finally does it. You know, you feel so great because this is a really great step forward. You could just hug him. But he is doing so good today. His temperature's down. He's been sitting up in the chair. I think it's very important to act as a link between the family and the patient because they have no connection with the patient. Once he comes in here, it's completely severed. And the only way they know if he's doing better, if he's doing worse, if he is at all, is to talk to the nurses. Okay, he'll be real excited about that, I know. Okay, Bill, she knows you can't talk to her, so you, you just go ahead and listen, okay? I think it's very important to touch a patient and then let them know that above and beyond all, there's somebody there that cares about them as a person, not just a body or a patient. If you concentrate on the people who made it, you know, you'll say, you'll see somebody you think, that person's not going to make it, and then someone will say, hey, but remember so-and-so, you know, we thought the same thing about him, and he made it. So that keeps you going. And watching a patient wake up is just, is just a real miracle. It, it's very rewarding to watch that and to know that you've held some small part. There will be an admission in five minutes. There will be an admission in five minutes. Well, I'm not a doctor, and I give everybody the best shot I can. If they're stopped breathing, uh, I still think that there's a chance that they might be able to be brought back down to trauma center. And especially if a victim's out there, if it was one of my family, I'd want to give them the best shot I could. We have to decide for landing at this time. You can have somebody that is um, bearing your death. And with the facilities we have here, you can bring them very much from the point of near death to uh, almost a total recovery. Open your eyes. Come on. 
85 percent of the people that, that come here end up going home. From my perspective, at least, uh, that's more fulfilling than anything else I can think of in medicine. Relax, babe. Oh, come on, slow, deep breath. And you have to give, and it hurts every time that they get hurt. And you just try to let them know that, yeah, it does hurt. It has to be done, and I'm here to help you with it. John, the bloods are here. John, take this. Trauma is one of the, well, it is the major killer in the under-37 group. Uh, this is the, the potential of the country, the, the new life of the country. Uh, and if you're able to save these people, you've really saved something positively. Scramble, helicopter one.